This is an exhibition of twos. Two mediums, two artists, and a series of binaries, such as death and rebirth, which the artists philosophically grapple with in their sculptures. For thousands of years, craftsmen have used gold and jade to create decorative and functional objects, which often speak to these themes. In the modern day, Taiwanese artists continue to fashion artworks which explore new and evolving ways to use the pure and vivacious mediums. This exhibition showcases two outstanding Taiwanese artists, Wu Qing, a sculptor who shapes intricate carvings in wood and then translates to gold using a mold, and Huang Fu Shou, whose skill for jade carving allows him to create impossibly delicate sculptures. Together, the artists have practiced their crafts for a combined century, producing artworks which resonate with the symbolism of their respective mediums. The gold that Wu Qing works is a malleable, brilliantly yellow metal associated with enlightenment in the Buddhist tradition. The jade that Huang Fu Shou carves is not one but two stones, jadeite and nephrite. The latter was one of the primary interests of Confucius, who wrote of its 11 virtues, such as its benevolence and musical qualities. As we tour this gallery, keep an open mind for the interplay of gold and jade as competing, and in some cases, symbiotic mediums in the depiction of sensory, environmental, and mortal themes, and discover how both Wu Qing's gold and Huang Fu Shou's jade share in creating legacies for their creators. Let's begin by taking a look at Wu Qing and his gold cast artworks. Growing up in the rural countryside of Taiwan, Wu Qing fell in love with the natural world at an early age. In fields and orchards, he discovered a language for complex human dramas in the microscopic interactions of insects. His first sculptural installation was a series of large carvings of ants, a motif which he has returned to throughout his career. Concerned that his wood carvings would decay in time, Wu Qing transitioned to pure gold, a medium which never tarnishes. Though he still carves the original model in finely grained wood, it is only used to create a mold from which the final golden artwork is cast. Wu Qing's reveries on Buddhist teachings became didactics in his artworks. Freshly bloomed flowers and skeletal remains span the life cycle, the incorporation of plastic propones environmentalism. And in many cases, his sculptures are only possible as a result of him introducing new technologies to goldworking. Let's take a closer look at three of Wu Qing's masterpieces on display in this exhibition. Prosperous Descendants. The first piece recalls Wu Qing's childhood moments playing under the melon vines, the memory which inspired this piece's prosperous scene. The melon vines grow along bamboo scaffolds made from bronze with mantises, dragonflies, butterflies, ladybugs, ants, caterpillars, and fruit flies on top. The piece exhibits the rich and diverse ecology of nature, patiently grounded, stretched, and assembled by hand. The bitter gourd's long vines wrap around the branch. This piece consists of thousands of components in all sizes, which is made by using the oxyhydrogen welding technique at a high temperature before being assembled. The complex and exquisite craftsmanship makes the piece vibrant. The entire sculpture would have taken 10 years to complete if a person spends eight hours a day on it. It is a rarely seen large-scale gold sculpture that requires complicated procedures and artistry to master. While this is not the largest gold sculpture ever made by Wu Qing, that distinction goes to an earlier and even larger sculpture entitled Endless. This is by far the largest piece in the exhibition and illustrates better than any other how many different components go into creating one piece. Parental love. The creative concept for this piece originated from the anthropomorphic interactions between ants. The mother ant feeds its child with maternal love. This is Wu Qing's first gold carving sculpture. Many of Wu Qing's pieces feature insects, specifically ants. Wu Qing began his artistic career by carving large sculptures of ants, and they remain a pervasive motif throughout his oeuvre. 
This piece speaks to several themes in Wu Qing's work, including insects playing out human drama and the relationship between parent and child. Zen. In Mandarin Chinese, cicada and zen are both pronounced chen. Wu uses cicada as a homophonic pun to represent the state of zen. Half of the insect is carved on the round sphere, but what about the other half? Is it inside or outside the sphere? Is it coming to this world or leaving this world? It seems cicada and zen are indistinguishable. Homophonic puns are common features of Chinese art. Another popular one that visitors may remember from the Bowers Museum's 2017 exhibition on the Empress Dowager Cixi's Fu, which translates to good fortune, is homophonous in Mandarin with bat. For this reason, bats decorated much of the architecture and serviceware of Imperial China. While jade and gold are very different, more than just impressive displays which challenge what is possible with metal and stone, Wu Qing and Huang Fu Shou use their respective mediums to explore many of the same themes. The nuanced selection of works speaks to two lifetimes of grappling with complex philosophical topics. Almost every sculpture in the exhibition delves into an individual's relationship to nature, one another, and oneself. Animals drawn from both gold and jade illustrate the artist's analogies for environmentalism familial relationships, and the ephemerality of time. Now let's look at the jade masterpieces of Huang Fu Shou. Huang Fu Shou began carving jade over 50 years ago. Since then, he has continued to hone his craft, not just by sculpting, but by becoming an acute observer of the natural world he captures in stone. Insects float upon blades of grass as near photorealistic likeness of their living selves. Drops of dew cling to plants, and the veins of decaying autumn leaves form organic architectures. Were the artworks of Huang Fu Shou the first pieces of jade one ever laid their eyes on, they would never guess that the stone is cold to the touch, an unwieldy medium for carving, or near impossible to mold into the paper-thin leaves and wing membranes the artist achieves through painstaking hours in a studio. Huang's works pay homage to the slow, examined life. They accentuate the beauty of simple pleasures and are subtle in their complexities, all the while pushing the boundaries of what is possible with jade. In addition to being an accomplished sculptor, Huang Fu Shou is also a talented poet, complementing each of his works with a short verse expounding its meaning. We begin by looking at one of the few series that Huang Fu Shou has done. A Tribute to Autumn, Series 1. Once upon a time, it was just a rough jade stone. It is the silence that has condensed for millions of years. Carving is the beginning of the conversation. The sound of carving is the screaming for resisting the loss of oneself. The jade can hardly stick to itself, even with a tough personality. It can be ground away little by little. It also touches the heart of the jade carver. If the jade carver is a little careless, the jade will break and the heart will be broken. When they go from resistance to harmony, the heart and the jade are combined into one. A dead leaf falls into eternity. The more than a dozen works which constitute a tribute to autumn are all reminiscent of dead and decaying leaves. Many of the poems related to his works, such as this one, describe jade as being a living, breathing substance with an innate warmth to it, a far cry from the cold stone slabs that the artist begins with. Heart Gate. In the chain, one link comes after another. Suddenly, over the dark night, it is tied to the heart, and the whole body becomes frozen and silent and it still longs for the warm light outside the door. Drawing a little bit of strength from the gap, it awaits the moment to break through the door. When Huang Fu Shou was an apprentice, he spent much of his time visiting museums and galleries, especially the National Palace Museum in Taipei. His dream became to exhibit a piece there as part of an exhibition, 
so he saved money to buy jade at every opportunity. Not sure at this point if he would be successful in his artistic career, he created this piece with a chain across it to illustrate his hardship during that period of his life. In 1999, his works were exhibited in the National Palace Museum for the first time. Dance for Summer The cicada remains dormant for years, just to sing over the entire summer. The cicada is like me, and I am like the cicada. We remain calm and focused, waiting for the moment to break out of the soil and sing for the brightest color of life. Because Huang Fu Shou's works are so closely tied to a study of nature, many of them become close looks at seasonality as well. Compare this to a tribute to autumn to see how works associated with different seasons take on entirely different structures to help develop their sensory impact. Flowing works such as this are inspired in part by the flowing strokes of large calligraphy paintings. Huang Fu Shou is himself an accomplished calligraphy painter. As we traveled through this exhibition today, we have seen how Wu Qing's works are deeply rooted in Buddhist doctrine and follow the sensory pleasures of his childhood all the way to the dawning of his spiritual enlightenment. Alternatively, Huang Fu Shou roots his work in poetry, almost every carving speaking to an unchanging or cyclical natural world and a metamorphosizing self. Both have found their legacy in their mediums that will long outlive them. Wu Qing with his never tarnishing gold sculptures and Huang Fu Shou with his nigh unbreakable jade carvings.